If you can, and you might not be able to, given the audience, take your mind back to 1992. You might remember, if you can remember back that far, wearing, maybe fondly wearing, maybe in my case not so much, wearing a shell suit to school, and the only thing that you really had to worry about was running home as quickly as you could to get home to max out the time that you had with Sonic the Hedgehog or Super Mario. Life was pretty good in the early 90s. It was simple. It was easy. There was nothing really that anyone had to worry about, at least as far as I was concerned. I was 10 years old at the time, and I'm going to take you on a journey to the last primary school disco that I ever had before I went up to the secondary school as a gawky 11-year-old kid. The school that I was at was, it was quite old and it smelt quite musky. And I vividly remember smelling that musky wooden floor. You know the sports hall floor that everyone probably trampled upon throughout their lives. Well, I remember smelling that as I walked in. And I heard the muffled beats of Black and White by Michael Jackson just kind of thudding gently on the floor as my mum left me at the door. And I joined my friends, Scott, Martin, Peter, and Andrew, tentatively around the edges of the dance floor, not really wanting to step in and do anything. And that was when I saw her, just out in the corner of my eye there, Kirsty. She was my first ever crush. And she was a pretty popular girl. And being a shy 10-year-old, being within about 50 yards of her was probably the scariest thing that had ever happened to me at that point. So, I did what every self-respecting introvert would do, followed by Scott, Martin, Peter, and Andrew. I marched in exactly the opposite direction, and I just went into the food hall. Now, the school that we were at, it was famed for its school dinners. They were so bad that they'd become infamous. And I'm pretty sure that every single person that I knew at school used to take their own packed lunches. Maybe because of that, maybe when we realized that the usually culinarily challenged school had laid on a raft of amazing hot dogs for us, maybe it was because of that that we made the split-second decision to join the back of the line. It was going all right. Things were going well. The free hot dogs were there. The free drinks were there. My team was there. And then what happened? As luck would have it, or maybe lack thereof, Kirsty sidled up beside me. Now, I make that sound like she did it on purpose. She had no idea who I was. But she came along, she stood there, next to me and next to my friends, with all of her friends as well. And I remember thinking to myself, this is not actually that bad. Girls are not that scary. I wasn't doing anything to make myself look foolish. I wasn't doing anything to make myself feel silly. That was about to change. Walking over to the hostess, as you do, and you're skidded through jeans from a school disco and your Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles t-shirt, I smiled at the hostess and put out my hand, ready to take my free hot dog. But, Instead of smiling back, she did something that completely floored me. That was about to change my life. She asked for 50 pence. And I was a poor kid, I didn't have 50 pence. Hoping silently that she would sense my embarrassment, you know, maybe see my cheeks flushing red, I thought, it's fine. She'll give this to me out of the good of her heart. She did not. Instead, what she very politely did was ask me to give the hot dog back and leave the line. In front of all of my friends and in front of Kirsty. Spinning around, I could feel the tears welling up in my eyes. Spinning around, I just hot-footed it. I was gone into the depths of the school, this little rabbit warren of corridors. And I remember sitting in a communal area on my own, for what seemed like forever, until Mrs. Beaumont, the school secretary, found me. She put her arm around me, and she gave me a glass of water. And I felt a dread, a cloud, place itself right there on my chest. Right there on my chest. 
My life had completely changed in that instant. Now you might be thinking, well, why did it change so much? What happened? Why, why did that affect you so much? And it, I didn't get it for such a long time, but then I came to realize that the reason that it affected me so much was because in that instant, I'd been made to feel and be perceived by people that mattered in such a way that I never wanted to feel or to be perceived again. That incident had given me a problem with money. Maybe, speculation, maybe that's why I quit college after a year at age 17. Maybe that's why. I was working a part-time job. I was delivering pizzas. Can't get away from the fast food. I was delivering the pizzas at the time, and that was all right. I mean, we all get college jobs. We all do our thing. We all earn a little bit of money, but do you know what? I still couldn't afford the CDs that my friends had, the clothes that I wanted. I still had that dread, that black cloud just sitting there, and I couldn't, couldn't quite shake it off. Maybe, speculation once more, maybe that's why I left home at 18 and landed at a cushy office job as a pensions administrator, and it was boring. It was so boring. But I could afford everything that I wanted. Until I couldn't. Until I'd spent my monthly salary. And I had nothing else until payday. Because I'd spent all of that money every single month on things that I thought would make me feel better. They did not make me feel any better. Maybe, the final bit of speculation for the day, maybe it was that problem with money and that dread feeling that I had that caused me to walk into my granddad's house on a Saturday morning. It was a cold, chilly Saturday morning. Maybe that's what caused me to walk in there to see my granddad with a crisp 10 pound note in my hand. Now, this is my granddad, Ruben. He was a steady horse guy. He did all right. You know, he'd have a little flutter on a Saturday afternoon. And often he would come back having won a little bit, treat my nana to some flowers, do a little bit of cooking for her, just to kind of dampen her anger a little bit that he'd had a flutter in the first place. I remember walking in there with that last 10 pound note and saying, Grandad, will you put me on a bet? I didn't have another penny until payday. But I had a surefire tip <laughs> from a friend. There was no way I was losing, not a chance. I was not losing, this guy had it going on. In fact, he got it from his granddad. How could we lose? So, my granddad took the 10 pound and we watched the race together. I lost, <laughs> obviously. I lost. Mark said, My granddad, as he put his arm around me and gave me one of his smiles, I'm going to tell you something that you might not understand. In order to win, you have got to be willing to lose. In order to win, you have got to be willing to lose. And he said that as he gave me back the tenor, having never placed the bet. Did I want to win? Yeah, of course I did. I wanted to win so badly because of that issue that I had with money. And not just win that race, but win at everything that I was doing. Win at life. But was I prepared to lose? No. I wasn't. The reason for that was very, very clear. My pride and my ego, they wouldn't let me lose. They wouldn't let me walk away from something that wasn't working. All I had to do, surely, was find another way to win. And as luck would have it, that actually happened just a couple of weeks later. I found myself with a brand new job. I moved from working in one city to working in another city. I was excited about the possibility of more fulfillment. I thought it was going to be fun, something new, something challenging. But most importantly, I was excited about the £2,000 per year pay rise that I got to take me to the princely sum of £20,000 per year. Surely I'd won. I had more money. So as I walked in that first morning, I opened the door, walked into the office, open plan office, sat down, turned my computer on. And I remember looking around 
just looking for signs of friendship, new kid, first day, looking for signs of friendship, all I saw were these gray walls. And then over the top of the partitions, those pale blue nightmares that we sometimes see in offices, I saw just empty eyes looking back at me over the monitors, over the computer screens. And it was then, it was then that I realized that I would never win, ever. I had sold 70% of my time, five days a week, 70% of my time, of my life, for an extra two grand per year. The worst part was that I would spend that 70% of time with people that I had nothing in common with for 2,000 pounds extra a year. Crazy. So I put my pen down, I got up, and I left. I was 23 years old, and that was the last job that I ever had. Fast forward a little bit. Two years, 2007, Rihanna was telling us about that umbrella that she used to own. I used to have some boot-cut diesel jeans that I used to adore. And somehow, weirdly, I decided to have red highlights in my head. I still can't fathom that one out, but I got away with them. I got away with them. In the two years since leaving that job, I'd become a freelance project manager. And I was working for some pretty cool people. I was working for the Ministry of Defense, and I was, I was freelance. But I'd also gone from earning 20 grand a year to just shy of 200,000 pounds per year at age 25. I'd won. That's it. I had won. I could buy anything that I wanted. I could go wherever I wanted. And I could do anything that pleased me because I had that finance coming through. And I thought I got it all right until one morning. I remember it well. It was a cold morning, not too dissimilar to what the temperature's like today outside. It was cold, but the car had frosted up a little bit. And this is why I remember it so well, because my hand was numb from defrosting it. And I got a phone call from my manager on the contract that I was working at the time. Mark, said Wendy, slight change of plan. We need you to go to the new project that we've just greenlit. The problem with that, it was four hours away. It required me to stay over all week. And it required me to miss my granddad's birthday just the week before Christmas. On the complete whim of a stranger. How could someone that I had so little in common with, who I barely knew, make me feel so sad, so annoyed, so embarrassed, and dictate and control my life so easily on their whim. And that is when I realized that I'd actually misunderstood the lesson from when I was 10 years old. I didn't have a problem with money. I had a problem with control. Flash forward now to the 25th of February, 2016. I was in New York, 11 hours earlier, I'd landed in the city, and I was going to be doing some work on a startup accelerator program. At the time, I'd quit that contract that gave me the money, but that had just made me lose all of that control. I'd started my own business. I'd gone back to earning 20 grand a year. In fact, sometimes less, because business is really, really hard. In fact, I remember logging into my business bank account one morning and seeing only 60 pounds in there. But I wasn't upset, I wasn't annoyed, I wasn't frustrated. The reason for that is that that 60 pounds, I'd earned myself without anyone telling me what to do, anyone telling me where I needed to be, and no one controlling me or pulling my strings. So when I woke up on the 25th of February, 2016, on that Startup Accelerator program, from a phone call from my dad, just one hour later, I'd packed my bag, and I'd gone back to JFK International Airport to catch a flight home. As I walked into the hospital room on the morning of the 26th of February 2016, just 12 hours after leaving New York City, I was extremely grateful that no one had been able to control my life at that point, that no one had been able to stop me making the decision to come back 
that no unseen puppet master had been able to dictate from a distance the life that I had to lead. I was grateful for that. And to this day, I'm still grateful to have been able to book that return flight home and spend an hour with my granddad. That was the last time I'd ever seen him. He died one hour later. Had I not been able to make that decision because of money, because of control, because of having to send that last email or get that last meeting out of the way or send that proposal in or meet that deadline, I would have missed him. Life is really, really short. And life is really, really precious. We're all a little guilty at times of forgetting what really matters, the people around us. We're all a little guilty of choosing that email and that meeting over the people, of getting that thing done because it's so important, of looking down at our phones instead of watching the kids. And as you get a little bit older, what you start to understand is what truly matters. When was the last time that that email actually mattered? Or that your Instagram being refreshed mattered? Or that that deadline mattered? Or that that game you're playing mattered? Or that TV show that you're watching mattered? When was the last time? I can't think of one. And as you get older, what you start to realize is that life is made up of a series of connected moments. The only job that we have is to connect the right moments to each other in the strongest possible way at every single opportunity. Because we're not here for quantity of experiences. We're here for quality of experiences. How can we say that we've lived to the fullest if all we're trying to do is win? So I want you to take this away from today. Control isn't about being controlling. Control is about making decisions based on facts, but also based on pulling together your dreams, your ideals, everything that you want to achieve, your happiness and your passions, and using those as your northern star. And remember that when we leave this earth, the only thing that we've got is the connections that we've made and how we have positively affected the people around us. And that is our only legacy. So the next time you're faced with a decision, ask yourself, does saying yes to this get me one step closer to living my ultimately happy life with complete control over my existence? And only if that answer is yes, should you say yes to that decision. Choose happiness, choose control. Thank you.